Welcome to our webinar, Law Talk, Sexual Harassment and the Educator, Part 1. We're pleased to have our General Counsel, Mike Shepard, as our um, presenter this evening. Mike Shepard is an experienced lawyer with 25 years of litigation and corporate experience. He's been an Executive Litigation Manager and General Counsel. He handles complex litigations in areas of medical malpractice, personal injury, ERISA, workers' compensation, social security, mass tort, commercial subaration, and business transaction. He has co-authored a number of articles for the National Nashville Business Journal and is founder of the Law Talk series. He is the general counsel for professional educators of Tennessee. If you have any questions during this session, Please type them in the chat section of the screen on your computer, and I will give them, or our um, somebody, our other panelists will provide those to Mr. Shepard so he can address those at the correct and proper time. Also, as a free commercial to um, as a free commercial for our professional development, we're trying to have all kinds of. Uh, webinars on Tuesday nights. Next Tuesday night we'll be using the educator resources on the professional educators resource page and we'd be delighted for you to be a part of that webinar as well. And now without further ado I'm going to change the presenters to our general counsel Mike Shepard and you will hear him talk and see his presentation. And please type any questions you have in the chat or the question section. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, first in the series uh, called Sexual Harassment and the Educator. We're, we've broken this presentation up into two, uh, that involving the student, and the second section will involve colleagues and parents. Um, we've, the, the presentation tonight will primarily concentrate on what is sexual harassment. We'll talk about some examples. We'll try to define it for you. We'll try to focus in on the classroom as we do so. Uh, everyone reads in the papers and watches on television how some of these uh, situations arise. In particular, it becomes a problem when you have people in positions of power or authority who don't behave themselves and offer up unwelcome behavior. So um, in this session we'll go over the day-to-day -day involvement with students in the instructional and social areas and what we're going to try to do is help you the teacher and or the administrator avoid the pitfalls, pitfalls presented by day-to-day -day humor and interaction and trying not to let people draw you into their sexual connotations or inferences. Um, let's define first what sexual harassment is. And um, the definition that is most acceptable by lawyers and authors is the unwelcome verbal, visual, or physical conduct of a sexual nature that is severe or pervasive and affects working conditions or creates a hostile work environment. Now that's a long definition and uh, we're going to break that up just a little bit. The first part of that definition is unwelcome. Um, if you're a teacher and you're at a football game, for example, and one of your female students or male students or uh, any student of the opposite sex and you score a a goal and everyone's excited and you hug, let's say for this this example, this is a male teacher hugging a uh, female t uh, student. Um, if, if that, I guess, embrace, it's probably not a real good idea in the first place, but if it, ha it does happen, uh, let's face it, if that's unwelcome by the student or, it, uh, you know, that's probably not something that, that you should do and you, should, you could know right away whether that's welcome or unwelcome just by the body language, uh, a statement, a look, um, a gesture. So um, that's the one I'm most asked about. 
uh, it's really concerning athletic events and just people getting you know excited and animated as their team does well so but a lot of this happens in the classroom there are uh, students that let's face it are not as um, self-disciplined as we'd like them to be they make comments about each other um, the one th thing we like to tell our teachers and our administrators and anyone else that's in the education environment is be careful about the environment wherein you empower people to say things that are unwelcome and and uh, um, to the point that you create a hostile environment for your students. The best way to stay out of trouble as a teacher or, or an administrator is to create the environment around you which is positive, which is educational, which is balanced, and has rules and boundaries. And one of the first boundaries that all teachers learn is how to relate to their students effectively and to uh, manage their behavior in such a way that no one could ever accuse that teacher of being complacent about either harassing a student sexually or permitting that to happen between two colleagues or uh, two students. So it starts and ends in the classroom and starts with your leadership. Um, the second, one of the second uh, or third definitions or descriptive terms that we talk about when we uh, discuss sexual harassment is that it has to be severe or pervasive. Um, that is something that we need to really be careful with. Someone barely brushes by somebody or pats them on the back, that doesn't seem very severe or pervasive. But if the, if the next, if the person doesn't really like um, to be touched, then, you know, it could be considered severe. In other words, it doesn't have to be uh, a, an unlawful touching or necessarily, um, you know, pervasive for it to be a problem for you. So, we want to be careful about not interfering with one's education or the right to participate in school activities free and unencumbered with distractions such as off-color jokes, uh, comments about attire, um, texts that have sexual innuendos, uh, and so on and so forth. So keep in mind though, conduct, conduct is not sexual harassment if it is welcome. Um, so, in other words, it's important to communicate uh, with the harasser that the conduct makes you uncomfortable. And these are things that you can train your students to understand, too, or talk about amongst themselves about uncomfortable. You know, they, the, the boy or the girl that is um, making innuendos or talking about sexual... Um, uh, jokes or possibly even doing more, such as uh, the examples of harassment that are on your screen now, uh, offensive name calling, um, and unwanted touching, spreading, or sexual uh, rumors, offensive sexual remarks in the classroom, impeding the work of a student or employee on the basis of discriminatory factors that could involve race, not only sexual innuendo or sexual harassment. So, you know, a lot of teasing about a subject or, or, a, t or a student that is maybe looks a little different or dresses a little different or if that student is dressed provocatively. Um, you know, we probably need to be careful about saying it's okay to, um, to accost that person and embarrass them. So, are, are you saying that we need to bring up these things in the classroom with the older students, the high school students, to actually have a session on this at the beginning of the school year? I recommend it only because I believe it raises awareness. It doesn't mean everybody walks around and creates problems where there are none, but it depends on the age 
of the audience, but um, between the grades 7 through 12, I think it should be discretionary on the part of the school, but students should be instructed and they should understand that they don't have to listen or be subjected to that kind of behavior. But more importantly, they need to be told what to do if they are subjected to that behavior. Uh, usually one time is enough, uh, and when you're told to stop, that means stop. Um, if it continues, then they should report that person to a designated individual of authority, which could be the teacher, guidance counselor, or principal. Okay, thank you. Um, there, a survey was done that I found very interesting in preparing for this presentation, and I thought I would share it with uh, our educators. Uh, in 2011, 1,965 students between seven, the grades 7 and 12 participated in a national survey. They shared their experiences and thoughts about sexual harassment during the 2000-2011 school year. And I hope this shows up well on everyone's screen. But these were, this shows awareness of sexual harassment in the school environment. Um, you can see that there were incidences enough for these students to respond. As you see, the first graph shows if they were the recipient of sexual harassment, they either ignored it. Um, which was the boys, the girls, 47% um, uh, ignored it, and 49% of all students ignored it. Probably not a good graph for what we want to have in our school environment. Um, as you look at the next graph, the next chart, it says, uh, you know, those that told the person or people to stop, 13% of the boys, 31% of the girls, and 24% overall told the person to stop. Um, you know, I think the, the one that's really interesting is uh, the, the large percentage of variance between boys and girls who tried to turn it into a joke. Um, you know, you look at the 22% that the boys did versus the 11% of the girls. Um, you know, the, the, the numbers still show that some did not know what to do. So um, if you look at the next chart, uh, which I found also interesting, um, you know, the actions that the students took to help another student being sexually har harassed at school, which again, what we're talking about tonight is not only harassment between student and teacher, which does on occasion happen, but we're talking about the breeding ground for that harassment, which is in the student body as well. And we'll talk about the student-teacher relationship in, in um, just a moment, but 60% um, observing the harassment told the harasser to stop. That was, that's a pretty good percentage, not quite enough though. They checked to see if the harassed person was okay. Um, they told a teacher, 24%, and then they told a parent or family member. Um, so, you know, a healthy percentage were actively involved in helping the person, but it could be, it could be higher. I have a, another question for you. If you are a um, witness of a sexual harassment, you're not a participant, obviously, but you're a witness of it, and the victim asked that you don't tell your mom, don't tell the counselor, don't tell anybody. What do you do when a student requests you don't tell somebody that they were sexually harassed? Well, peer pressure is always a factor, as we all know. Uh, we've all lived through it. We've all, uh, a lot of us have children that face it every day. Um, I think with a open environment where you discuss these things and you take them seriously and you never see a t teacher participate or overlook um, these events or these, these infractions and actually this abuse of, of uh, 
someone's personal rights and freedoms, I think you will find that that won't work, that peer pressure. You will, you will erode that peer pressure because everyone's on the same page. This is unacceptable. Our teacher behaves the same way every day. Um, when he is approached by a person who, for example, has a special relationship with that teacher, um, that teacher handles it well and keeps the distance and understands that the, their emotional um, spectrum is not as well developed as it could be or would be at that age and that you're the adult and that you need to lead by example. The more they see of that, the more they see of the training at the beginning of the year and the more you see of students who are acting improperly being dealt with immediately, I, th I believe that that peer pressure turns into peer support. Um, next chart is... I'm, I'm uh, going to jump in for a second. Sure. Can you hear me, Mike? I'm going to jump yes, in for a second. Um, Bethany didn't introduce me. I'm Samantha Bates. I'm the Director of Member Services here, and I taught middle schoolers for five years. Uh, one thing that, that I saw teaching is that um, elementary students are, are drilled um, not to tattle. And so when I would have middle school girls being touched inappropriately or boys making jokes about them, they were uncomfortable coming to teachers because they felt like they were tattling on their classmates. Right. And so I, I think you're completely right with setting the tone early and um, letting students know as they develop you know, hormones, as they start to grow into young men and women, um, what harassment is because they don't know the difference between, um, you know, he's touching me, he's touching me, and he's touching me inappropriately. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, at an early age, the tattling is a factor, and as you grow into other grades, uh, you know, it, it becomes more of, why did you uh, get me in trouble? I was just kidding around. Um, you know, I, I think student leadership and empathy uh, in some schools in Tennessee in particular, uh, our leaders are doing a much better job in having zero tolerance policies in many areas, and I think this needs to be one. Um, and the ones that exhibit leadership in the student ranks that are held up for, um, you know, for positive uh, evaluations and and are are recognized as doing the right thing when they do it. It, it helps quite a bit. Um, the chart we're looking at right now is. Um, suggestions by the students for reducing sexual harassment in the school. Uh, and they range from creating a way for students to report prob problems anonymously. And that's something I think we really need to consider. Um, does this have to be an open report that um, creates a lot of problems in that peer pressure area? So uh, I think that's an interesting comment that all those students made. They would like to see an anonymous uh, reporting system. Um, they definitely believe in punishment and they, they really want a contact person. And the, the uh, holding in-class discussions, if, being who I am and how old I am, I guess, and having experienced it even at the college level, um, you know, I, I believe that these in-class discussions, in my opinion, should move up. But I think this is a, a pretty savvy group of students who have who have responded this way, um, offering workshops. Um, personally, I, you know, workshops are not nearly as effective as day-to-day -day experiences and reference points and guidance and boundaries, in my opinion. Um, offer information online about sexual harassment. I'm not sure what that means, and quite frankly, I was a little confused by that. Um, so if anyone has any questions on that or comments they'd like to make to clarify, maybe I'm just not understanding that. But um, uh, Samantha, are you online? 
I am. Uh, what do you think that means, offer information online about sexual harassment? Does that mean um, talking openly about it or? It sounds like the students would like more resources, maybe about what it is, a place where they can go online. Like if it was at school, a student might see them taking a flyer or a brochure, but if it's online, they can do it anonymously. Their, their peers oh. don't have to know they're researching it. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. That makes sense, a little bit more sense. Um, um, so anyway, I, I believe these studies open our eyes a little bit about how our students are aware of what's going on. They're not stupid. They, they're emotionally mature and uh, at times, the, you know, maybe they, uh, um, maybe they need uh, or at least their, their, uh, their students that they go to, you know, need to be reminded of it. I think everyone feels much, much better. So we get to the point where we ask the question, what can educators do? Um, if you look at this slide, there are six things that uh, we suggest. Um, you know, we need to teach students what sexual harassment is. Um, give them ideas how to handle it or experience it or even better, witness it. A strong message is sent within a school system when you see a witness standing up for someone who is being harassed. Um, and I'd like to say this as a lawyer, it, you need to do this for a lot of reasons, not just because of the student and because it's the right thing to do. You don't want to be charged with creating or fostering or allowing a hostile uh, educational environment under Title IX or Title VII. These are, these are federal laws. You can't have students um, not getting the education they're entitled to because of being subjected to the, this harassment. So um, doing nothing is not acceptable. You have to be an active participant and leader um, toward avoiding all of this and making sure that there's a system in place for handling uh, any infractions. Um, and that's number two, to seek assistance with the, within the school system promptly. Um, talk to someone they trust. We all have our favorite teachers. We also have our favorite administrators, our counselors. Sometimes you want to talk to them rather than your, your teacher. That, that should be encouraged. Um, keeping a written record of what's going on is, is very important by all involved, administrator, teacher, and student. Uh, make it very clear the, her, to the harasser that the behavior will not be tolerated and report to the uh, authorities and file the appropriate forms. Those are pretty obvious uh, questions. But I think all of this um, starts and ends with uh, education and edu educating the student, the administrator, and the teacher as to how the team of teachers and students and educators can work together to have a thriving, vital environment, learning environment without these silly distractions that are actually can be pretty cruel and uh, illegal. So um, let's see, to ch how can students help? Um, to challenge sexual harassment. I think this slide uh, taken from a quote from one of the responders uh, says it all. Take a stand against the person doing the harassing and don't let them get away with it. If more students would fight for their rights instead of being scared, stand up to the abuser, life would go a lot smoother. What can administrators do? Um, make sure the school enforces the internal school non-harassment policies. Uh, walk around. Management by walking around sometimes works. I mean, obviously we like to have engagement of, of the entire school. Uh, know, know what's going on in the, in the classroom. Know what kind of, you know, jokes are being told or how, what's the social temperature. Uh, in, in your classrooms. Uh, uh, Title IX that's mentioned there, uh, we're all aware of that and uh, 
there's protections under that as well. Um, so, and, and, and Title IX basically says this, and it can be construed and, and interpreted and embrace not only Title VII violations, but, but these uh, sexual harassment violations, and that is no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So there you go. There's more reasons than doing it just for the right reason. Uh, I mean, for because it's <laughs> because it's the, it's the it's the moral thing to do, and we need to protect our children. Uh, and finally, uh, I think um, that's the end of the slides. Let me go um, back here just for a minute and repeat one other um, back to what can educators do. Um, I, I, I really think it's important that everyone understand what a hostile work and form, uh, environment means. Uh, a hostile work, a work environment or learning environment is that this is be taken on such a dimension and such a large section of the day or that it is preventing these students from um, the learning experience that they're entitled to under the law. So um, quid pro quo, everyone knows what that is. I mean, this is, uh, you know, an authoritative person such as a teacher, they look very, very strongly at what you say and what you do because you are in authority. And um, EEOC and Title VII and Title IX investigators, they, they want to know that, you know, um, that authoritative person goes overboard to be careful in this very important area. So. Um, uh, we've talked about examples of sexual harassment, but, you know, we all know that there's transmitting and posting of emails, texts, and pictures. Um, we don't know who's got their phones out, who are passing information between themselves, but I can tell you parents don't like that if it's occurring during school time. Um, they're not going to like it if... Uh, and the, and, the, and the student shouldn't be doing it in the first place. So um, sexually suggestive music. Um, I don't think you can turn the radio on now without being kind of uh, embarrassed. Uh, as a grandparent, anyway, I feel that way. But uh, um, I, I believe in summary that it, it begins and ends with what, what we do best, and that's education, empowering the students to do something once they understand what they see and um, make sure that they are re enforced and reinforced and supported to do the right thing. Um, can you just one more time go over some things that to most of us are common sense, but things when a I guess it's kind of normal for sometimes students to kind of fall for their teachers. But what are common sense things that teachers should avoid to help situations not to get out of control? You're, you're talking about um, kind of a crush right. that, that, that one of the students has on the teacher. Right. Um, you know, I, I really believe that the teacher, if they're alone with the student, that's one kind of advice I would give. If they're in a group, I would give them another uh, kind of advice. But I would not be alone with the student at any time. Um, you know, I would make that a rule for yourself. If you feel that uh, a student has a crush on you or is just, uh, you know, there are many ch children out there that don't have mother and father figures at home. It could be just simply a matter of they look up to you, they respect you. But it, you have to test their emotions and their attitude by just simply asking them questions. If they want to talk to you about something in private um, that may be totally innocent, 
uh, if you see it going on and further than that and they are not having their own friends in the classroom and not interacting socially with their friends and there's more interaction with you than should be, then there's probably some counseling, the guidance counselor and possibly uh, some discussions with your colleagues should take place to see what's happening in other classes. Um, if it gets to the point of physical, which we have had that happen, where a student has actually tried to kiss a, a, a teacher, um, the, what you have to do then is immediately back away. Of course, the common sense thing to do, unfortunately this person did not do it, uh, but is to go to the principal or get away from that um, being alone with that person immediately and report exactly what happened. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Could you go back to the administrator slide? Could you go back to the administrator slide for a second? Sure. I think it's the last one. We had several administrator type questions. Um, the first one is, do you believe implementing a clear policy against sexual harassment is key to preventing it? That's the first half of the question. Do you believe implementing a clear policy is key to preventing it? Sorry. Is that it? Is that the yes. slide? That's it. Yeah, that's the slide. I'm sorry. Go, uh, please restate. <laughs> I was too busy working, <laughs> working the, You're fine. the PowerPoint. I, uh, I, I know that feeling. Do you believe <laughs> implementing a clear policy against sexual harassment is key to preventing incidents? Uh, I believe it is, but it has to be uh, a vital policy that, that lives and breathes, and that is Otherwise, it becomes more what they call propaganda, and that means it has to be utilized uh, frequently. It has to be referred to frequently. It has to be uh, understood by the students and the administration and the teachers. And I think with that as a guidepost that a lot of problems can be avoided. And uh, absolutely, I think that's very important. Okay, the second half of that question was, could you review a policy for a school? Like if, if the school wanted to implement one, uh, Mark in Chattanooga wants to know if you could review it before they implemented it. Absolutely. That's why professional educators of Tennessee is here, and that's why our lawyers are here um, to, to help in those areas and to prevent and advise and counsel. Be happy to. I have one more question for you. Um, when you're aware of sexual harassment in your school, at what point does it go before, from referring a student to the counselor or to the principal or to referring them to law enforcement? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I think the most obvious answer to that is if, if there is... Um, I guess I, I would say that a lot of it has to do with frequency. Um, what is being said? Has there been any, been any physically physical touching? Has there? Uh, how unwelcome is the are the statements or the actions and the content? If it's um, if it's obscene and profane and vulgar and it, it involves sexual connotations and it's more than just a minor slip up um, and it looks like this person is going to act upon uh, what they're going to, you know, what they've been saying and this person is going to school every day. Um, I, I, th I think the, the authority should be brought in. So, um, it's, a, it's, it's really hard to draw a line in the sand. It really depends on the evidence of each case, but you know, it, it is unlawful to, you know, even a kiss is actually considered um, sexual, 
sexual battery of a minor. Okay, so even the mo the least amount of sexual interaction should be reported to to the police. Um, you know, by anyone, um, whether it's a student, administrator, or a teacher. But um, I I think uh, the the police. Uh, and the law enforcement uh, would would definitely want to investigate a situation where a student, teacher, or administrator is very concerned that their policies have been violated. Number one, that the that the person has been victimized, and that they are being subjected to what we considered really discrimination. Um, you know, and and the abuse of uh, that kind of unacceptable behavior. So uh, we don't want to overreact. Again, I think Samantha t touched on something in elementary school when things uh, go wrong and people say, "Don't touch me there," um, and the person doesn't do it again. But it's a little different when you're talking about 16, 17 year olds and you have a very aggressive student or either making the comments constantly or physically touching or making overtures that they're going to do it after hours or they're going to uh, uh, not let this go. So um, I, I think it's a matter of discretion, but I, I would think it have, would have a lot to do with the actions of the perpetrator. Okay, thank you. One of them is about victim confidentiality. Um, if the victim requests that you don't tell, I guess, the perpetrator who they are or asks that the complaint not be pursued at all, um, what should a teacher do in that situation? Uh, you're saying the victim says they don't want uh, the teacher to do anything? Pretty about much, it. yes, yeah. Um, I think I would probably want to talk to the parents probably right away. Okay. Um, that would be my first position uh, along with the school officials, but I would definitely involve the parents. Um, I think that's our obligation as educators is despite the, the less than desirable fallout from all of this, the safety and um, the education environment has to be preserved at, at, at all costs. That's a difficult situation to be put in, but I think the call would be to, to go ahead and report it. And what about uh, victim confidentiality? Um, victim confidentiality, uh, I'm not sure that, that that's necessarily a legal term. Um, the, the victim, if, if if, if the person's a minor, obviously we need to be very careful about, um, you know, this doesn't get printed out. But if it's happening right before us and we have an obligation under the law to report it, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but the, if, you're, if you're not of the age of majority and you're being subjected to sexual harassment, um, you know, it's our legal responsibility to handle it. So uh, I don't know that I would necessarily not do something because someone says victim confidentiality. Um, I think if, it, if it's a serious altercation such as uh, uh, sexual advances or something worse, I mean you're talking about newspapers and police and, and everyone else being careful about keeping the victim's name uh, confidential, but within the school system, administrators need to know and the police need to know. Um, where could someone, other than next month's um, webinar from us, where could someone get more information about schools' responsibilities to address and prevent sexual harassment? Well, there's a, a very good website that J.C. Bowman, our executive director, uh, pointed out to me, which I think it's, uh, it's uh, on the U.S. Department of Education website. 
Office for Civil Rights. It's on the web. There's many uh, places out there, um, um, but I mean that seems to be a good starting point. Um, are you talking about developing policies for this? Um, I, I think that'd be a good place to to start. Yeah, I th I think the. There, there are policies out there that, that are in many schools already, and uh, reinventing the wheel is not always necessary, but there is a lot out there. But the Department of Education website is a good place to start. It has some, actually some examples, some scenarios that uh, could help um, with the person who is in charge of drafting these policies. Um, I would encourage the leadership of the, each school to, and each uh, county to um, involve, you know, the uh, you know the drafters of uh, the policies for that school. But I would admit, I would I would say that they don't have to be varied, and they certainly don't have to be different that different from school to school. It's the law is pretty clear, and um, now training as far as uh, sexual harassment, uh, if someone needs it, and you know that should be provided. If they've been uh, a professional has just doesn't understand what sexual <laughs> harassment is, um, that person needs to get guidance and instruction and help right away. Um, we assume that everybody understands what it is, but that's not always the case. Um, so uh, I think that's a good starting point. I think other policies uh, that exist in this state are out there, and they're very, very good. Okay, we have um, we have one uh, listener who notes that the OCR letter of October 2010 is very good with examples as well. I'm okay. not sure what OCR is. I feel a little silly not knowing, but I'll Office go ahead and admit to that. Of, Office for Civil Rights. Okay, Office Possibly. of Civil Rights letter. Okay, yeah. all right, good. And then um, another question just came up. Are gay and lesbian students protected from sexual harassment? Absolutely. That's all I can say. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is no difference. As far as you know, you know the the discrimination for sexual orientation and and um, I mean it can be just as uh, that can be whether whether you're gay or or or, or not um, if it's unwelcome behavior that's enough and the courts have held that continuously. If it's unwelcome behavior, it's pervasive, and it involves sexual connotation, whether it's touching or, or, or what, it, it, you know, gay, gay and lesbian are, are protected. So, I, I just yes. thought of another question when you said that. Sometimes um, back in my day when I was a teacher years and years ago, um, the, the Behavior may not be unwelcome if it's between two students. It might be something that they both are welcoming, but they shouldn't be doing it probably ever, but certainly not in a public situation. What do you do when there's two welcome students that are participating in, in your presence? Well, that's not really sexual harassment, is it? But um, to say that it sets the bar and creates uh, examples of improper behavior and opens opens us up to exceeding the acceptable boundaries. Um, I think that's where it, it, it would hurt the program or the policies that would be in place. And we would ha certainly have to control that behavior because uh, that generates uh, more wrongdoing and more acceptability of wrong behavior in society, whether it's openly open affection and sexual contact between two students, 
um, and somebody else sees that, they think that's all right, and they start harassing someone else. So the best thing to do is a zero tolerance policy um, in, the, in this key area of sexuality. Are there any more questions? Okay, there was another one. That, yes, how do we protect severely disabled students from sexual harassment when the student is unable to tell someone or seek help themselves? Uh, good question. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know that there's one answer to that other than um, I think questions have to be asked in a way that is not suggestive. Uh, I think there has to be proper um, presence of people in authority present and witnesses. Um, you know, if if there is a situation where a student is involved in something like that or a teacher or an employee or, or, or uh, anyone else for that matter, um, I mean that would be a horrible sense of guilt and feeling of responsibility for what happened to someone who could not cry out. So I guess uh, I, I would suggest that uh, policies and procedures be put in place that if there is someone that cannot protect themselves that are so vulnerable uh, that you know they could not they could not um, uh, you know communicate what's going on I think we need to make sure that they are never put in that position so um, that that's a tough one because you you try to do everything 24 hours a day seven days a week and we would hope that we would provide the uh, safeguarding and protection that would be necessary so that would not happen. Okay, are there any more questions? There was, there was one um, attendee with his hand up and I think I deleted that but I never got a question so I don't have any more questions that I see. That doesn't mean there aren't any, but I don't see any more. Okay. Well, like I said, if you have any more questions regarding this webinar, please email us at professional.development at proedtn.org. If you have any questions about your certificate, please email me personally at bethany.bowman at proedtn.org. I'll try to get those sent out to you tomorrow morning. Also, I want to um, advise you to please check out our website and um, the Professional Educators of Tennessee. Next week I'll be doing a webinar on the educator resources. We have hundreds and hundreds of free websites that are available to teachers if you just know where to find those. Thank you very much for participating and please tell all your friends about our webinar series and thank you for being a part of our organization. Good night. <laughs>